Thank you again for just being here, Lord, and for the privilege of being in your presence and of joining that countless multitude that worship you in heaven and on earth. And Lord, I pray now as we get into your word, Lord, that you would speak to us. Lord, that our hearts would be in sync with yours, Lord, and that we would hear you above whatever the anxieties or challenges that we have in our life. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, turn with me to Genesis chapter 12. We're going to go through this uh, passage uh, for the next few minutes. Last Sunday, as uh, Pastor was announcing about us praying during the week for marriages, uh, this thought came to me, uh, which is in this Genesis chapter 12. Because I think one of the areas that, of, or hot buttons in a lot of relationships is this whole question of leadership. How do we discern God's will, particularly as we are, as we are couples, right? It's when we are alone, we, we get it, or we get it, or we don't get it. But once we are in a family, it has wider repercussions. And I think that's one of the challenges that a lot of us struggle with, myself included. And I, as I was sitting and during the week, I was remembering uh, about 11 years ago when uh, I visited here uh, for a couple of days and realized during that visit that God was calling us back from Canada to Mumbai. And I remember on the flight going back, wondering how do I tell this to Maurice, right? We just bought a home, we just settled down, and we thought that was where we were going to be for some time. And I w wished that the Bible told me what Abraham told Sarah, right? Because then I could have said the same thing, right? But the Bible doesn't tell us what Abraham told Sarah, right? Uh, but yet somehow Sarah followed Abraham, and we don't read about any dissent uh, when she did so, right? We know Sarah had a mind of her own, because when she got crossed with the maids, etc., she expressed it and expressed it quite strongly. Uh, even when uh, she was promised a child, you know, and she didn't believe, she laughed. But there's no mention of any dissent when Abraham comes to her and says, Darling, we're going to go. And I don't know where we're going, but we're going. Right? And she goes on with him. And, uh, and while Abraham is listed as a man of faith, and we think of him, we sometimes forget that so is Sarah as well. She's also listed in the Heroes of Faith, and in First Peter, Peter writes about her and he says in chapter 3, he says, In the same way the holy women who lived long ago and followed God made themselves beautiful. Yielding to their own husbands, Sarah obeyed Abraham, her husband, and called him a master. And you women are true children of Sarah if you always do what is right and not afraid. And that's critical at the end. If you always do what is right and are not afraid. My message today is not about calling your husband's master a lord. I won't get lunch. But, uh, but the principle behind it is that uh, Sarah followed Abraham. The scripture says she obeyed him. And the Bible doesn't tell us what Abraham said to her or his family. But there was enough for even his nephew to follow him. His father also left with him. And yet I believe over the last few many years I would say one of the answers to that is, I believe, her confidence in Abraham's relationship with his God. She had confidence when Abraham said God had told him something, God had told him that. Abraham wasn't hallucinating, Abraham wasn't passing on his wishes, firing over God's shoulder, but it was actually that God had spoken to him. And I believe that for each one of us as families, if we have to address that issue, if God has to if there has to be leadership in the home, then our families need to be able to see and trust that relationship that we have with our God. And as we read this, and if you go to Genesis 12, and let's start reading it together, in verse 1 it says, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land I will show you. I will make you a great nation, I will bless you, and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing, I will bless those who bless you, I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. 
So Abraham departed as the Lord spoke to him. And Lot went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. So Abraham departed. Other translations would simply say Abraham went. One of the things as we look at Abraham's life is when God came to him and spoke to him, each time Abraham moved. Abraham didn't dilly-dally. Whatever it was, he moved and he took the place. He took the direction and he responded fairly quickly. And perhaps as a starting today, before we get into the dynamic between Abraham and Sarah, which is really what I believe I want to focus on this morning, perhaps some of us are struggling in that space today. We've got a call. We've sensed the nudging of the Spirit. And God's prompting us to go somewhere or do something, singly or as a couple, and we're struggling with that. Because today you and I don't get audible calls, right? But we sense the Lord speaking to us. And my question is, how do we respond to that? John Ortberg, a noted writer and speaker, he re recalls his own experience when he was feeling God asking them to move. And he wanted to go to Chicago, and he felt God saying, go to California. Right? And if you know the US, that's kind of the opposite direction. And somebody shared with him from Dr. Zeus, uh, from his book, All the Places You'll Go. And this is what he says. You have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself in any direction you choose. Or the places you'll go, except when you don't, because sometimes you won't. Right? It's from a book called All the Places You'll Go. Right? There are opportunities. God comes and he speaks to us. And God comes to Abraham with the promise. And he gives Abraham three promises. And that's not the focus today. But he gives three unconditional promises to Abraham. But what matters is the journey. It's not so much the outcome, but it's the journey. It's the adventure of following God and going with him. And very rarely does God, as John Ortberg says, very rarely does God come to someone and say, stay. Almost never does God interrupt someone and ask them to remain in comfort, safety, and familiarity. He opens a door and he calls us to walk through it. It was by faith Abraham obeyed God's call to go to another place. God promised to give him. He left his own country, as Hebrews 11:8 says, not knowing where he was to go. Put yourself in Abraham's place. He's 75 years old. Sarah's in her mid-60s. You've lived in one place all your life, in a community you've known since birth, and now God has spoken to you. And you live in a pagan culture, so most people would not even believe that God had spoken to you. And he's given you promises, and Abraham believes that those promises are worth it. So even before he knows, he has no clue yet where God's going to lead him, but he believes that the promises God has given him are worth it. And so before we get into this, I want to ask three questions of ourselves, and I ask it of myself too. Firstly, am I seeking God's will deliberately and passionately today? Am I seeking God's will deliberately and passionately? Do I really want to know where he wants me to be today and tomorrow? Charles Swindoll says, of the seven deadly sins, sloth may be the most sinister of all. Deadly passivity can consume our lives, and before we know it, we have nothing to show for our years. Sloth isn't laziness. At its core, sloth is disconnecting from what should keep us passionate. It's cruising. It's switching off. Sloth is failing to follow the course set before us by God, failing to fulfill our divine purpose. In Hebrews, it talks about David. He served his generation. He fulfilled the purpose that God put him there. And God has placed each one of us here in this season, in this time, with a very, very specific purpose. The psalmist says that all my days were written in your book before the first day was there. God has a plan and purpose. Am I fulfilling that? Am I seeking to fulfill that? Secondly, if God were to ask me today to leave my comfort zone and to move to the unfamiliar, how would I react? First and foremost, like Abraham, do we trust the Lord's character enough to believe that we can obey him without knowing all the details. God never really gives us all the details, right? He doesn't give us a complete roadmap. It's one step at a time. But we can only operate if we have the trust that he has our best interest at heart. If we know that he knows better than us and he has the best plan for our life. 
Am I willing, like Abraham, to take a short-term loss for divine blessings that I can't see today? Secondly, husbands and fathers, do our wives and children trust our character and walk with the Lord enough to follow the Lord's leading through our lives? If we have to take that position of leadership in the home, they need to be able to trust that we are in that place where God we have that relationship with God. And just as they trust God have their best interest, even though we're flawed and we fail and we will continue, they need to have confidence in our relationship with the Lord. And thirdly, am I making obedience too complicated? And I think this is something we all struggle with. So often God gives us a prompting. He shows us what he wants to do. But now we want to check it out, right? So we talk to too many people, we ask too many people's opinion, hoping that someone will give us a good reason why we shouldn't do what we know we should do. Or perhaps we can find a way to delay or do it without the hardship that seems apparent to go with it. Or that perhaps God will just change his mind if I take long enough. Right? If we know what God wants, obedience is not complicated. It might be difficult, but it's not complicated. When God reveals his will to us, it's pretty clear. It's not always easy. But as we look at Abraham's story, Abraham's story doesn't end over there. And I want to continue. He leaves, he leaves with his wife, he takes us there, and he sets out, and he starts moving towards Canaan. Verse 5. <coughs> then Abraham took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's sons, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abraham passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree of Moreh, and the Canaanites were there in the land. That tree of Moreh was a place, these large trees were where people worshipped. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. So Abraham sets out on his journey, he comes to this point, he worships. He builds an altar, he worships to the Lord, the Lord meets him, the Lord reiterates his promise to him. And then we see he continues on in verse 8, he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel and he pitched his tent uh, with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. Basically this is where Jerusalem was going to come later. Uh, and again we find that Abraham builds an altar there and he calls on the name of the Lord. Again he worships. So far so good. He's moving along and each stage he's stopping, he's worshipping and then he moves on, going on still forward to the south or to the Negev as the other translations uh, will say. And what was the Negev? The Negev is a desert. Basically Negev means dry and parched. And here Abraham faces the first challenge uh, of this journey because a famine hits the land. Genesis chapter 12 verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land and Abraham went down to Egypt to dwell there for the famine was severe in the land. This season of hunger represents the first major test that Abraham has on this journey. And I believe for each one of us, God will bring us into these places. Because we are on the journey, because we followed him, because we're doing what he wants, it doesn't mean that it's going to be smooth. Right? We will come to these seasons of famine in our life. If you look at the history of the Israelites towards the end of Numbers, uh, they moved, I think I counted it some 35, 36 times. Right? And almost every three or four times they went to a place where there was no water. They went where it was a desert. But remember, it's the cloud that's leading them there. And as Moses recalls when he looks in Deuteronomy, he says, the Lord tested you again and again to know what was in your heart. God takes them there not because he doesn't know what they're going to do. He knows what's going to happen. But he takes us into these seasons so that we know what's in our heart. And Abraham had to learn that as well. A divine response usually reveals our default response to a crisis. God already knows what the future holds but he uses the trials to reveal ourselves to ourselves. And each one of us has a default response. Where we go when the things get tough. It starts as a self-preservation reflex and it gradually develops into one of our strengths. And before long, each of us has a coping mechanism that automatically takes over. 
and keeps us from trusting God. In Abraham's case, it was deception or lying. He didn't lie to cheat people, but he lied to save his skin. And I don't know for each one of you what that is. I know as I was thinking through it myself and looking at my own life, I can identify a couple of things, those things, right? Where we kind of feel, okay, I'll fix it this way, right? It's worked in the past, I'll work again. We know it's not probably the best thing to do, it's certainly not the most right thing to do, but that's where we tend to go. And Abraham failed his first test when he rushed down to Egypt instead of asking God's counsel. Famine came, but we have no record that Abraham asked God, well, what should I do in this position? Lord, you have brought me here, what should I do? Now, let's be fair, okay? Abraham has come from the valley between the Euphrates, okay? So, one of the most fertile places on earth. So, he probably has no experience of what to do in a wilderness or in a famine. He's got a large household, he's got livestock with him. So, this must have been a panic. He has no experience. And yet, we have no record of him building an altar or praying while he goes down to Egypt. He goes to his own default mechanism. He failed his first test. And now we don't see anything until he comes out of Egypt again. And Egypt in scripture is always representative of the uh, alliance with the world. F.B. Mayer, who comments about this, he says, Abraham's choice of destination has far-reaching theological consequences. Figuratively, Egypt stands for an alliance with the world. Abraham acted on his own judgment he looked at his difficulties and became paralyzed with fear. Thus, without taking the counsel of his heavenly protector, he went down into Egypt. A fatal mistake. And yet, I think each one of us, we still do the same. We're children of God like Abraham, and yet in a moment of panic, when something happens, when the crisis hits us, we reach out and adopt methods of getting ourselves out of it that, to say the least, are questionable. And by doing that, we sow the seeds of sorrow and disaster, perhaps just to avoid a minor embarrassment where we are. Running to Egypt was not a sinful decision per se, but however, like all decisions made without faith, it becomes a precursor to a moral tumble, as we'll see in the next few verses with Abraham. When we do things without ref referral to our Heavenly Father, without asking His thought process, what happens is the consequences always start going downhill. And we read in verse 12, just before they arrive to Egypt, Abraham says to his wife Sarah, I know you are a very beautiful woman. When the Egyptians see you, they will say this woman is his wife. Then they will kill me, but let, me, let you live. Tell them you are my sister so that things will go well with me and I may be allowed to live because of you. And in case each of us is feeling very smug that we would never do that to our wives, and I hope we never do, but uh, as Pastor reminded us a few weeks back, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, if you think you're strong, be careful not to fall. After the first service, uh, Benedict came up to me and said, this is an indecent proposal, and I said, thank you, you gave me the title. <laughs> right? I mean, a man of faith, okay, this is the hero, a friend of God, and what does he do? He basically asks his wife to lie for him, and he puts her, as we'll see, in an extremely, extremely vulnerable position. Technically, it was a half-truth, right? Because uh, they were sort of half-brother and sister. And what he was trying to do was hoping that by claiming to be a brother, he could use the local customs to his advantage. If the ruler liked your wife, he could kill you and take your wife. But if he wanted your sister, he had to come to you because as her brother, you were her protector. So therefore, Abraham hoped that he would have some time to figure something out and sort it out if su such a situation arose. But we find that they call this bluff. And in verse 15, it says, the Egyptians saw that Sarah was very beautiful. The Egyptian officers saw her and told the king of Egypt how beautiful she was. They took her to the king's palace and the king was kind to Abraham because he thought Abraham was her brother. He gave Abraham sheep, cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. Can you imagine Abraham's predicament? Right? His wife on one side is being wooed by the most powerful man in the kingdom, 
and I've worked and lived in the Middle East, okay? And even today, if the sheikh decides to take a shine to your wife, you're in trouble, right? Uh, in those days, it was much worse, right? And here Abraham is uh, stuck in this situation. And uh, only thing in his favor is that if they did take somebody in their harem, there was a waiting period to make sure that they were not already pregnant. And so in this much time, there's time for something to happen. And Abraham, in the meantime, is getting gifts, right? It's not just that his wife's being taken, but he's being uh, loaded on with more and more wealth. So while Sarah is in the harem alone, imagine how she felt about her husband. Here she's locked up, taken away in an extremely vulnerable position while he's hobnobbing with the elite of Egypt and getting richer by the day. I mean, that really goes towards making a great relationship, doesn't it? Right? And that's the situation. Husbands, can we relate to this? Do we realize what a huge impact our lack of faith or leadership has on our families? Okay, it may not be as spectacular as what happened here with Abraham and Sarah, but it does. Have you and I jeopardized their future because of our lack of courage? I have to admit, as I look into my own life, that I have done that at times. And I fear that I could do it again. And though I'm blessed to be married with a Sarah, only the Lord's mercy has limited the damage that has happened to that. And my prayer for each one of us is that we would not be in that space. That we would have the courage to go to the Lord and do what the Lord would have us do. But thankfully, God steps into the situation. And where Abraham fails to protect his wife, the Lord does so. And we find that uh, the Lord puts a plague or diseases into uh, Pharaoh's house. Basically, the word says diseases and infestations. They came down sick. And everybody in the house, even his servants and his harem, and everybody gets sick. And Abraham realizes some, uh, Pharaoh realizes something is wrong. Pharaoh acknowledged Abraham's God, but in a pluralistic way. The ancient view of disease was that it, at its core it was a spiritual thing. If you got sick, you had offended some, one of the gods. And while they treated it with oils and lotions and even surgery, the, fundamentally they knew that you had to placate the god that you had hurt. And so Pharaoh realizes that he's, he's crossed paths with somebody and obviously since Sarah is the only one who's not ill, it has to be Abraham's God. And he needs to uh, appease uh, Abraham's God. And so somehow he discovers that she has a husband and he now takes off on Abraham. And he says, verse 1920, he says, what have you done to me? Why didn't you tell me Sarah was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister so that I made her my wife? Now here's your wife, take her and leave. Basically he says, get lost. Then the king commanded his men to make Abraham leave Egypt. So Abraham and his wife left with everything they owed. Here is the pagan Pharaoh who, having to rebuke Abraham who should have been morally superior to him. And instead he's scolding him. And again, how many people have yet to embrace the God of the Bible because they continue to live in the shadow created by our moral failures? Paul writing through 2 Corinthians, he says, as he looks at his life, he says, there's nothing that we have done that could ever stand in the way of anyone coming to know Christ. Right? That was his own testimony. And that should be ours. But as we look in our own lives, I think if we're honest, how many times have we put somebody off uh, because we haven't done the right thing? And those who should have, who think that we should know better, actually look at us and say, well, what's wrong with these people? Pretty sad. What a pathetic impression. Uh, Pharaoh must have had about Abraham's God. Pharaoh could have well taken his gifts back, but perhaps out of fear of, of uh, hurting Abraham's God, he just says, get lost and take everything with you. But remember, with all the gifts of livestock and servants, there was a servant who went along with them called Hagar. And this is going to have a shadow later. So these things continue. The fallout continues over the years. And so it's beloved how important it is that at each step of the way we take counsel from the Lord and we find his guidance and we do what he would have us do. So before I close I want to leave a couple of lessons with each one of us. God doesn't give up on Abraham as we look down this 
uh, and we continue, we'll see that Abraham goes back out of Egypt, he gets back on track, and the journey with God continues, and he continues to become a man of faith till he becomes one of the greatest men of faith. God gave the promises to Abraham before, and he knew exactly what Abraham was going to do. These were unconditional promises that God made to Abraham, and God was going to fulfill them. And he, it's the same for each one of us. Our failures doesn't shake God's commitment to us. And I pray that for each one of us, that that commitment to us would help build the trust, that our faith would become as solid as Abraham's did. But a couple of lessons. Firstly, everyone faces famines. No one is exempt from that. Some famines are severe. There's death, there's cancer, there's divorce, unemployment. But each of these things creates a crisis of faith, challenging us to answer that fundamental question, who do I trust at that point of time? Where does my confidence lie? All of us will face that, and not just once. As you look at even the people of Israel, it comes again and again. Because we crossed it once, it doesn't mean it won't happen again. Because God continually does that to test our hearts so that we know where our trust lies. But husbands, a word to you too. The famine is not a reflection of your leadership. It's a test of your leadership. Sometimes I think our identity is so closely tied up with it that we feel we've failed when these crises come. But it's our test of what, how our response is to the crisis. Not, our crisis is not a, resp a result of what we have done. Secondly, every escape contains a lie. When we seek to avoid the crisis or escape through our old familiar methods, we tell ourselves a lie that I can do this without God. We convince ourselves with that in enough ingenuity or luck, we can survive the famine or dodge the pain. Getting to the truth of our hearts is like peeling an onion, and that's why the Lord has to take us through these seasons again and again, because each time it helps peel away one more layer till we really get to know where we are or who we really are, and what we are like. Thirdly, every Abraham struggles with a weakness. And that means every one of us struggles with a weakness. None of us are exempt. All of us have areas which cause us to make unwise choices. And we're not immune, no matter how old we are, how many years we've been a Christian, how many times we've read the Bible, uh, we're still susceptible to these tests. And if Abraham could fail after raising two altars, so can we. Fourthly, every compromise jeopardizes us, Sarah. Whenever we revert to our default response, someone gets hurt. And usually, it's someone who's the closest to us. And in the context of our families, it's our spouse, our children. Sarah trusted Abraham to lead her well and to keep her safe. But his self-serving scheme made her the newest addition to Pharaoh's harem. Imagine how she felt at the end of that day. She must have wondered, what am I doing here? How could he have done this to me? Our lives exist in concentric circles. Those closest to us are the most connected to us. And as a result, they trust us the most. As someone has said, there's no victimless sin. You may sin in private, but you never sin alone. There's always an impact on those around us. Fifthly, every Egypt has a pharaoh. We live among those who don't know the true God. They serve the gods of wealth, of power, possession, status. And then they hear about someone who has a relationship with the Creator, and their curiosity is aroused. And they look to see how that person's life and our lives differ from theirs. And then when they see us blundering along, making foolish or unwise choices, we bring shame on the name of our God. And we confuse the curious. No one respects a phony. Beloved, people are looking at us. Okay, people do see the difference. And they wonder what makes us tick. But there needs to be consistency in that. We all are surrounded by pharaohs. God has placed us in this place for a reason, so that we can speak into their lives. I pray that we would 
be conscious of that. And lastly, if you have been blessed with a Sarah, honor her. If God has blessed you with a spouse, honor her. Proverbs 19.14 says, a wife, wise wife is a gift from the Lord. Ecclesiastes 9.9 says, the wife God gives you is your reward for all your earthly toil. And as Peter says, and you women are true children of Sarah, if you always do what is right and are not afraid. Sarah did the exact opposite of Abraham. Abraham did what was wrong and he was afraid. But Sarah was the one who did what was right and who was not afraid. And I believe the Lord provides for each one of us as he brings us into union and he puts us in as families. He create, brings these unions that compensate. So our strengths and weaknesses get compensated by the other one. And we need to accept that, acknowledge it and use it and allow the Lord to use that. Sometimes we tend to still want to be solo warriors in our relationship, right? And we lose the benefit of the, that God has given us through our spouses. They counterbalance our weaknesses through the strength of our partner. So let's not miss the grace that is ours, husbands and wives. And so as a church, as we pray for strong marriages, let's thank God for what he has given each one of us in our mates. Acknowledge our weaknesses, respect the leadership model that he has established within the family, and each one of us, let's serve him fearlessly like Sarah. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word and the examples that are in your word. We thank you, Lord, that each one of us has feet of clay. And yet, Lord, you know us well, and yet you love us. Your promises don't change. They're yes and amen, as your word tells us. And so, Father, I pray that for each family that's represented here, Lord, each individual that's here, Lord, that we would be obedient to your call on our life. Lord, that we would follow you wholeheartedly, without fear. And yet also I pray, Lord, that you would bind each family together. And Lord, that you would bless each husband and father, that Lord, our walk with you would truly lead our families closer to you. Lord, we thank you for our spouses. We thank you for their love for you, for their faithfulness. And Lord, we bless you, Lord, for giving them to us. And now I pray, Lord, that you would send us out of here, Lord, that we would go out in a world surrounded by pharaohs, that we would bring honor and glory to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. As we sing our